Oxford Progressive English by Rachel Redford. Grade 7. Unit 1. Revenge. Reading and Meanings of Difficult Words. An old Burmese man tells his first-person story which takes place in the teak forests of Burma, Myanmar, when it was a British crown colony. Elephants were used to drag the immense tree trunks into the rivers for transportation. The logs frequently jammed and then an elephant would use its skill and weight to unblock the jam. At this time, the Burmese workers were under the control of an English overseer, Mackay, an unpleasant young man whom the men called Mackay the Keen. The day before the story starts, Mackay had ordered the Burmese overseer to send in one of his elephants to unblock a mass of jammed logs. Afraid to disobey Mackay, the Burmese overseer had ordered his nephew on his gentle elephant, Shui Dok, to obey this very dangerous order. Whilst carrying out the order, the nephew was killed by a falling log. The storyteller begins his story just after the nephew has been buried. Paragraph 1. I was staying the night, as always, in the Chinooks Thai. We ate a sparse meal and afterwards I stepped outside to smoke a cheroot. Usually a camp is full and bustling at that time of day. But now I saw, to my astonishment, that there was no one about, I could hear nothing but frogs and owls and the feathery flapping of great jungle moths. Absent also was that most familiar and reassuring of a camp's sounds, the tinkling of elephants' bells. Evidently, no sooner had the soil been tamped down on the dead man's grave than the other Usus had begun to flee the camp, taking their elephants with them. Paragraph 2. The only elephant that was still in the camp's vicinity was Shui Dok, the dead man's mount. The Shinook had taken charge of his nephew's riderless elephant after the accident. She was restless, he said, and nervous, frequently flapping her ears and clawing the air with the top of her trunk. 
This was neither uncommon nor unexpected, for the elephant is, above all, a creature of habit and routine. So pronounced an upheaval as the absence of a long familiar handler can put even the gentlest of elephants out of temper, often dangerously so. Paragraph 3. This being the case, the Shinauk had decided not to allow Shwedok to forage through the night, as was the rule. Instead he had led her to a clearing, some half miles distance from the camp and supplied her with a great pile of succulent treetop branches. Then he had tethered her securely between two immense and immovable trees. To be doubly sure of keep her bound he had used, not the usual lightweight fetters with which elephants are shackled at night, but the heavy iron towing chains that are employed in the harnessing of logs. This he said, was a precaution. Paragraph 4. A precaution against what? I asked. He gave me a sidelong glance and said in a soft, slippery voice, just a precaution. There now remained in the camp only the Shinauk and me and of course, McKay the Keen in his tie. It had not rained much through the day, but with the approach of evening clouds had begun to mass in the sky, and by the time I blew my lamp out and rolled out my mat there was not a star to be seen. Soon the storm broke. Rain came pouring down and thunder went peeling back and forth across the valley. I had been asleep perhaps an hour or two when I was woken by a trickle of water, leaking through the bamboo roof.
Paragraph 5. I was almost asleep again when, through the chatter of the rain, I heard a tiny, fragile sound, a distant tinkling. It was far away but approaching steadily, and as it drew nearer I recognized the unmistakable ringing of an elephant's bell. Do you hear that? I whispered to the Chinook what is it? It is the cow, Shui Dok. Anusi knows an elephant by its bell, it is by following that sound that he locates his mount every morning after its night-long foraging in the forest. Perhaps, I ventured, Shui Dok was panicked by the storm, perhaps she managed to break loose of her fetters. If she had broken loose, the Chinook said, the chains would still be dragging on her feet. He paused to listen. But I hear no chains. No. She has been freed by a human hand. But whose could that hand be? I asked. He silenced me abruptly, with a raised hand. The bell was very close now and the hut was shivering to the elephant's tread. I started to move towards the ladder but the Chinook pulled me back. No, he said. Stay here. Paragraph 6. The next moment the sky was split by lightning. In the momentary glare of that flat sheet of light, I saw Shui Dok, directly ahead, moving towards the tie, with her head lowered and her trunk curled under her lip. I jumped to my feet and began to shout in warning, Thakin Mikay Thakin. Mikay Thakin had already heard the bells, felt the tremor of the elephant's approaching weight. A flame flickered in one of the tie's windows and the young man appeared on the veranda, with a lantern in one hand and his hunting rifle in the other. Paragraph 7. Ten feet from the Tai Shuedo came to a standstill. She lowered her head as though she were examining the structure. She was an old elephant, trained in the ways of the working herd. Such animals are skilled in the arts of demolition. It takes them no more than a glance to size up a dam of snagged wood and pick the point of attack. 
Maketha Keen fired just as Shwedok began her charge. She was so close now that he could not miss he hit her exactly where he had aimed, in her most vulnerable spot, between ear and eye. But the momentum of Shwedok's charge carried her forward even as she was dying on her feet. She too hit the tie exactly where she had aimed, at the junction of the two cross beams that held it together. The structure appeared to explode, with logs and beams and thatch flying into the air. Maketha Keen was catapulted to the ground over Shwedok's head. Shwedok turned now, until she was facing the assistant's prone body. Then, very slowly, she allowed her dying weight to go crashing down on him, head first, her weight rolling over in a circular motion. I threw myself down the hot ladder with the shin out close behind me. Running towards the tie I stumbled in the darkness and fell, face first on the mud. The Shinnok was helping me up when a bolt of lightning split the sky. Suddenly he let go of my hand and unloosed a hoarse, stammering shout. Paragraph 8. What is it? I said. What did you see? Look. Look down the ground. Lightning flashed again and I saw, directly ahead of me, the huge scalloped mark of Shwedok's feet. But beside it was a smaller impression, curiously shapeless, almost oblong. What is it? I said. What made that mark? It is a footprint, he said. Human. Thank you.